I'm sure Reinhardt's going to have some questions. <laughs> so, uh, oh, let's start with the remark. Uh, you were talking about fourth. I didn't know you were that deeply into fourth. Anybody that wants to do hardware hacking at a really low level with high levels of abstraction, fourth is fantastic. If you want to make your disk drive or your hard drive sing, or you want to do your Wi-Fi, do some weird stuff, fourth is interactive right down to the hardware. It's great, particularly on smaller processors. And people at Kit, Kit Peak Observatory seem to think so, like Charles Moore. Yeah. Uh, for me, I've been into fourth a couple of years when I was young, and it blew my mind in a positive way. I can really advise it. Yeah, the kernel, I think, took 3.7K. <laughs> uh, I had a complete uh, development environment that fixed, fit into 16 kilobytes. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't understand what 16 kilobytes means nowadays. But you had a, a complete text editor, a debugger, a assembly it code, the whole, the whole yeah, everything was possible in 16K. It's about three times more compact than assembly language. Yeah. Anyway, fourth for the hackers here. Uh, John, yes. uh, 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 can you project a little bit to the future, like the coming five or ten years, how will they look to a hacker like me? Do I, I need to ditch my phone? Well, barring any major catastrophes, it would wipe out the internet, and hopefully the internet will still be around back then. Uh, I'd like to try to see if I could inspire people to bring the internet into something more localized, and smaller groups of people using, uh, using uh, mesh networks in local communities, uh, mesh wireless networks, to build their own, what, what I call a prepper's data warehouse. It, uh, it, what is it? Uh, the Wikipedia now probably has about 30 or 40 terabytes of information, so you could actually get the mirror of Wikipedia on a local machine and provide a community of, of people in a very small, out, out, outwood, kind of backwoods area that would have all that information but not rely on the internet anymore. It would be rep mesh radio instead. So I like to see that happen. Now, I don't know whether that's going to really happen or not, but I'd sure like to see that happen. Okay, thank you. I saw two more questions. One was over here. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of people, when you uh, tell, talk to them about security, then they say, ah, I don't have anything to hide, so I, I don't really care yeah, about it. Yeah, that's the American and, attitude. And I, I was wondering, how can you convince people that their security is very important, that it's more important than well, they I got realize? Well, th I got three things to say about that. When you go home at night, and you go home, and you're going to go to bed, what do you do to your doors of your house? You lock them, don't you? What do you do to your car when you go shopping? You lock your car, don't you? What do you do when you want to write a letter to your girlfriend? You put it in a sealed envelope, don't you? Well, if you take that kind of an attitude when you're passing information around to your friends, I think that that can change a whole new perspective. My goal is, by the end of the year, every single bit of information that I send to everybody is going to be encrypted. Mm -hmm. The only public information that I'm going to have, have will be uh, uh, an, an, an unsecured way of people just to contact me. And then what I'll do is I'll just give them my wicker name. You guys kind of contact me on wicker name. You just pick a wicker name that I don't know has anything about what you, what's related to you. I don't know who you are, but you know who I am. You can remain anonymous. I don't really have care either way about me because I'm already pretty public. And so, and so if you want to be as anonymous as you want to, but yet still contact me and still have a, the ability of communicating very securely, that would be the best way to do it, because Wicker also does a nice thing at the end of the message. It deletes the messages after, after a certain period of time. So if you want your messages to be deleted after an hour of reading them, it'll delete them, and you won't have those messages around anymore for any friends, teens to go in and take it from you. So they, these are some tools that I, we'll talk about that. You know, I'm, I'm going to be around for a little while, so after this, I'm sure you guys can come up to me privately and talk to me about it. So, no, 
really seeing any questions at the moment. Um, John, I heard that you were actually not just writing code, but you're also writing a book. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Uh, the book's going to not be about, it's not going to be a very technical book. In fact, I have a non-technical person writing the book with me. It's going to be about my life. It's going to be about what I, what I do when I grew up, how I am who I am, how I think out of the box, how I do things, my approach to certain problem solving. And, uh, and it's going to involve a lot of non-computer related stuff like my very heavy involvement in the rave scene in the 90s. Uh, my very heavy involvement with an organization they call themselves The Loft. It's not L-O-P-H-T, by the way. It's called L-O-F-T. This is a building in San Diego. It was a four-story building. And they call themselves Artist Colony, Inc. And for $25 a month, you could go in there and you could have access to all kinds of art. Art supplies, you go in there, you have access to a complete MIDI system. You go in there, you have access to computers that have a T1 connection, high-speed internet connection. And it was a wonderful place until just there was just too many people that just got into big power trips. And, and a lot of people just got control trips going and everybody just bailed out after a while. But that's one of some of the things that I've been involved in. Uh, not to mention, of course, my uh, involvement in pirate radio back in the days. <laughs> There's lots and lots of things I'm going to be talking about, and it's going to be uh, a group of small stories. I'm not sure how I'm going to publish it yet, whether it's going to be like a, a, on an iPad. I, I, I'd like to do an iPad version of it, where I have the location of wherever I lived. You simply put in the date. You hit go and it goes through to Google Maps and pins out where I lived at that date, if that place still exists. But three places where I used to live do not exist anymore, so I guess we won't have those in there. Google Maps in that. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see a question in your mind. Um, I mean, I, I totally for privacy and I like. Like I support your suggestion that we should encrypt everything, but what bothers me, and I would like to hear your opinion, is that you know sometimes in many situations we just don't have a choice. Like Windows is implanting uh, like uh, key loggers into their operating system. Like laptops, the Lenovo is caught your time uh, having root kits, hardware root kits on our laptops. Uh, Apple, the, the iPhones they already have pre-installed strange certificates which you cannot delete and they're tracking our locations without even if we like switch it off. So it seems like we almost do not have options and that even if we will encrypt certain amount of data, we are still like kind of like naked. So what is your opinion about that? And like, I mean, well, what can we do against all of this? As far as Windows goes, don't use Windows. <laughs> As far as Linux goes, I mean, it's an open source system and you can build it in any way you like and you could develop your own encryption system if you want and the one that's really secure and a lot of the people in, in the ADM group and you're, you, that are using Jabber now are, uh, are very happy with it, what they're using and that was how Snowden got a lot of his contacts uh, from uh, making contacts with uh, Ed Greenwald and all the people that, that helped him get his information out. And so, yeah, you're right. And Apple is a closed system, but Nico Sell and her efforts to write Wicker, she has no love for the NSA. <laughs> and I have no idea how she was able to pull strings to get Apple to approve Wicker. But uh, there's been talk that uh, Apple is not, does not have any back doors in Wicker. And uh, then, as you know, of course, Apple's got their, their, their systems encrypted now, and it's frustrating the hell out of law enforcement. So, yeah, uh, there are choices out there. You just have to make the right ones. Uh, but, for example, for some people, like, we are, if you speak about, like, several, like, security-aware people or who are, can build own, maybe even Linux, the kernel, like, compile, but what about, like, other... Like, yeah, okay, so that's, why that, that's what we're doing with the, with the Anana box. We're going to make it a turnkey system. You don't have to know diddly squat about how to use it. You put this thing in your backpack, you connect it to a, to a Wi-Fi, two Wi-Fis, one, one to your coffee shop and one to the Wi-Fi of the 
of the Anana box. And uh, that's it. And we're then going to open it up. It's going to be open source. Uh, then if you want to go in there and muck with it and make it better, you can do that. Because that's the way I like to see future software development happening. In the very beginning of software development, just to get the John Q public interested in just using it, and not the diddlers, not the people that are really experimenters, but just the normal person who just wants something that works, just put it a closed source, but make it open source later. And that's how PGP got started, if I'm not mistaken, as well as Snort. Snort, the intrusion detection system. There's, there's a, what's called Source Fire now, the commercial version of Snort. And then they got the uh, open source version of Snort. Snort is an intrusion detection system, which is often used for uh, secure systems. I designed and built an uh, intrusion uh, prevention system around Snort and OpenBSD. Uh, we installed Snort on an OpenBSD system, and we installed Barnyard, which is a, which is a support system for Snort. And then when anybody tried to do anything funny and it would trigger a Snort rule, well, we just simply put it over to a little honeypot, let them buzz around in there for a while. So we had, we had our little sneaky ways of doing things, uh, you know, but it was all open source stuff and it's always good to, good to be in, you know, playing around with open source. Because you learn more by open source than anything else. You don't just learn how to operate a computer, you learn how to, you know, write software. Uh, can you reflect a bit on the, the, the new cryptocurrency Bitcoin blockchain invention? Ah, Bitcoins, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally don't have Bitcoins yet. I don't really think I have a need for it yet. I'm thinking of getting a Bitcoin wallet and probably putting, putting $100 in there just to have a few Bitcoins on hand in case I need a few of them. But I think it's a great idea. It's, uh, you know, you, you don't, and it's not controlled by the banks anymore. And any time you want to get away from controlling of the banks, man, that's always a good thing. So, yeah, I support Bitcoins all the way, for sure. Yeah. Um, the American government is pretty open about not really, uh, they are not a big fan of encryption uh, types that they can't decrypt themselves. So uh, how That's do you know? That's problem. Yeah, but how then? How do you know that the, the <laughs> encryption types like AES uh, that they support that they are safe? Because the uh, well, the, the source yeah. code for the it's uh, the source code for AES two fifty six, and it's and it's the mill grade encryption that almost everybody uses, yeah. including the government. Yeah, is all is all is all open source. So it's it's not very. Uh, it's not very hard to, you know, validate the integrity of the encryption system. And the Russians are doing a pretty good job with their program called Telegram on the, I on the uh, iOS iPhones. So uh, what's been in the news uh, uh, is that a couple of the encryption methods have been uh, backdoored at the, 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 the algorithmic level, at the uh, algebra level. Uh, that there are some oh, number generators some. that are uh, wrong and such. And one of the things that oddly, I don't know why, happened in the Bitcoin design, is that they used particular algorithms, curves, EC curves, electric cryptography curves, that are not the ones that NIST of America uh, is supporting. So that's something funny going on there too. You can use Here? their same software, but with different algebraic properties that you may trust more than something that America promotes. Here is something how you can test your encryption algorithm without even knowing the source code for the encryption algorithm. If you encrypt data and have a way of representing that data so it's being displayed in such a way that you can look at that display and it's truly random and there are no patterns in it, there is a pretty good chance that that encryption algorithm is going to be pretty good. But if you see little lines running through your little thing, you, 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 you basically you plot it on, on an XY grid, of your encryption thing, you probably just take your data and you just just run it into this machine, this 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 processing thing that just plots x y plots on a line, and and if it's truly encrypted, 
it's going to be random. And it's, and it's the randomness that really tells you that the encryption is going to be good. And I, I, would, I would definitely, you know, make sure that uh, if I had a new encryption uh, s system brought to my attention, and if I really wanted to spend some time, which I don't have time to do that, is I would probably write a bunch of little graphic programs that go in there and take that data, which is supposed to be random, and display that data in such a way as I don't see any patterns. Because if I see a pattern, then that's a flaw in the encryption algorithm. In fact, that's how the uh, Enigma got broken. They used the Enigma code twice. That's true, they did lose one of the machines. Okay, so we have time for one final question. Uh, see a lot of hands. Um, can we take a hand over there? Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, since uh, you mentioned uh, Assange and uh, Snowden, how do you think they will affect geopolitics? Well, let's hope it's going to be for the good. Uh, I mean, from what I'm understanding now from Snowden's efforts, uh, they are doing a little bit of work in protecting privacy. I mean, they, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to eliminate as much as they can this bulk data collection process is going on. But, you know, it's the government, and they can always just slap a national security on it and make it top secret and do anything they damn well please. So no matter what happens, they're still going to get it. And so that's why it's important to use encryption. Now, what would you want to use encryption for? Uh, private messages to your friends? That's a good, that's a good reason. Uh, sending passwords to systems, for instance, you're working with a group of people and you want to send a password to your system because you can't figure it out, but somebody, not, somebody else can, you would probably set a password up and you wouldn't put it on Gmail or on Skype. Of course not. You'd put it on Wicker or Signal or something. And so, so passwords, uh, financial information, obviously medical records is going to be something really important to encrypt. So there's all kinds of reasons for you to use encryption. It's just you need to start just using it. And what's good and what's bad in encryption? Well, if you're a beginning in encryption, PGP is bad. It's too complex. It's too bloated. You have to have this key management system and this PGP tools and keep track of everybody's PGP key when you want to send them a message. And it just becomes a, 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 a thing. But, but when I'm using like Wicker, I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. You know, I, I, I make contact with a person, get his Wicker name, and when I, when I generate a session with him, I generate a session key right on the spot, negotiate the uh, connection, make the call, put the call through, point-to-point uh, -point encryption, goes over the cloud as an encrypted form, no metadata, no record of the call, winds up on your iPhone, you can read it whenever you want to, it stays on your iPhone until you read it. And if you can set it up so, it, so that message can go away in an hour, you can just simply slide that little slider over to an hour and presto, that message goes away in an hour. So there are real easy ways to use encryption, just people aren't really, they don't really realize it now, you know. PGP as an as a, as a, as a encryption program, if you use a 4096-bit key, there ain't no way the NSA is going to break that code. They can break a 1024-bit key, but they cannot break a 4096-bit key. They just don't have that computing power. They could probably do a 1024-bit 10, key in about a, in a week or so. If they put all their processors to it, all their machines that in, uh, in, in Utah, <laughs> that big data center they have. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. For being here.